Their images are etched in the earth, and legends proclaim they created the wonders of the world. From fictionalized villains to real-life heroes, through scriptures, folklore, and mythology, they are woven into the fabric of history. Giants are the personification of all the problems that mankind must overcome in this hostile world. They're in our fairy tales and our nightmares. Giants are relevant to us because they tell us about our own past. Legends tell how their colossal strength moved mountains and how their iron will could move a nation. We naturally change these stories in a way that helps us understand the world at our time. They represent the struggle between good and evil in ancient religions. And they remind us all of the undeniable power of the human spirit. Giants, friend or foe, next on the History Channel. 50 feet tall, the strength of 200 men, the fortitude of a Roman army. Legends, myths, and ancient folklore tell powerful tales of giants that held up the heavens and walked the earth. In so many cultures, there seems to be that little grit of sand that there was a giant species once roaming the earth or the locality, and it's around that grit that the pearl of the legends of the giants has formed itself. Regardless of race, region, religion, or age, every society has created legends about giants as a way to help explain the unknown. In cases where large formations are found or bones are discovered that can't be explained or giant footprints, it's very common to imagine a race of giants that walked the earth and left those remains. Giants also, I believe, represent dream figures, figures of the imagination, figures of nightmares. It's natural that, that out of those dreams come stories of giants. The origins of giant stories can be traced to the dawn of man. Nordic cultures were among the first to equate giants with the beginning of civilization. They were called frost giants, mammoth human-like creatures who were as tall as mountains. There is in Norse mythology a world of light and a world of mist, and the world of mist is very cold, and the mythology is that a warm wind blew up from the world of light, created clouds in the world of mist, and from that clouds a breed of giants emerged, the so-called frost giants. The frost giants were particularly ferocious, but were also incredibly clever. They represent the forces of chaos. In a battle for superiority of the earth, the frost giants fought an army of Norse gods led by a warrior named Thor. Thor, son of Odin, led a number of campaigns against the giants into an area in which nothing could live except giants. To battle the frost giants, Thor wielded walls of thunder and bolts of lightning, the power that later became known as Thor's hammer. The threat of the frost giants and also of the lesser and more barbaric storm giants had been known for quite some time. And so the heroes were gathered together so that they could fight the giants. Thor, along with the other gods, fought a ferocious fight against the frost giants. Ultimately, it was the wisdom of Thor's father that persuaded the frost giants to surrender. In the end, it was the extreme authority of Odin which finally sent them back into their darkness. But it was the Greeks and Romans, some of the world's first true storytellers, who created the types of giant legends that still exist today. There were gods like Hercules and Zeus, who often were depicted as being the size of 100 men. And there was a race of giants called the Titans, and a god named Atlas, who many believe held up the earth, but actually was doomed to forever hold up the sky. 
there is a figure by the name of Perseus who comes to try and defeat Atlas. Perseus takes the head of Medusa and shows it to Atlas, which turns him to stone. And as a result, that's where mountains come from. And with his strength, the strength of mountains, he's holding up the sky and the stars and the heavens. The ancient world was also filled with snarling, grotesque, one-eyed giants called Cyclops that devoured man and animal alike. It's believed that some of these creatures also had second sight, the ability to see the future and predict the fate of men. Though they are the stuff of fiction, the story of the Cyclops is actually based in archaeological fact. The story of the Cyclops is a very interesting story and, uh, on many levels, but, but one of the points that interests me the most is that uh, the concept of the Cyclops probably comes from finding the head of a mastodon or an elephant. Because if you look at the skull of those animals, they have a big round hole where the trunk comes in and the actual eye holes are on the sides. So it looks just like a Cyclops. It looks like this would have been the head of a giant round-eyed monster. One of the best known versions of humans battling these creatures was when Ulysses kept the Cyclops from devouring his men. Ulysses and his sailors encountered a Cyclops when they landed on a magical island inhabited only by giants. The men were trapped in a cave blocked with a huge rock that only the Cyclops could remove. The Cyclops has sheep, which he eats, and herds. And every day he goes out with the herd. At that point, Ulysses and his men figure that they will take wine and try to get the Cyclops to sleep, and then take a huge stick and try to gouge the eye out. And so they sneak under the sheep's belly, and the Cyclops is trying to feel around for them, but only feels the top, and they're able to escape. And so the triumph of the civilized man over the great barbaric pagan, no matter about the strength, brain over brawn, is evident from the story. Most early cultures, especially religions like Christianity, used stories of giants to accentuate their message. These were the pagans who had to be defeated. Uh, so they gave them attributes like monstrous strength, destruction of property, even down to eating human flesh, especially that of children. And this put them beyond the pale. Giants were the last vestiges of the old pagan religion, which had to be destroyed. Perhaps the most famous story depicting sheer courage against overwhelming odds comes from the Bible's book of Samuel. It's a story about a young shepherd boy named David who was willing to pit his limited skill and strength against the champion of the Philistines, Goliath. David and Goliath's story actually for me is one of my childhood. It was part of our culture that we should have this image of some intelligent, small, underprivileged person who is going to go right out there and help everybody else to understand how to overcome adversity. At this time, the Israelites were in a pitched battle with their arch enemy, the Philistines. It's said the Philistines had a legion of giant warriors, and the leader of these behemoths was a towering evil killer named Goliath. Goliath is described as being six cubits and a span in height, which translates to about nine feet, nine inches. Now, in earlier texts, including the texts found in, uh, among the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's four cubits in a span, which would translate to be six feet, nine inches. So I believe that, that Goliath was indeed a Philistine warrior, and at that time, a warrior who was six feet, nine inches would indeed be a giant, certainly towering over the shepherd boy. Each day, he would come down to the river and challenge the Israelite army to come and send out a champion who would fight him. The prophet Samuel said that Goliath could be defeated and that he would be defeated by a boy. 
David volunteered to take on Goliath, armed only with his slingshot. It was a skill he had honed as a boy, protecting his flocks from roaming packs of wolves. It was a simple weapon he would take into battle. The giant, in an arrogant moment, says, why have you sent this shepherd boy? I will eat him alive, and I will throw his carcass to the sheep. David took his sling and a few well-rounded pebbles. He swung and fired a stone, which caught Goliath in the middle of the head. It was enough to kill Goliath. In a final act of defiant victory, David placed his foot on Goliath's lifeless body and cut off his head. The victory so shocked the Philistines that they fled in disbelief that a mere shepherd boy could wield such a blow. It serves to demonstrate the victory of the children of God over the forces of paganism. And the forces of paganism embodied in a massive man, Goliath. The story also illustrates how the image of a giant can be used as a moral lesson to show how the meek can defeat seemingly insurmountable odds. We have here a story for people to gain courage from those, even though you might look the weakest, is to use your intellect, to use your courage, and to use a sense of pride to go forward and to take it on. At the heart of the David and Goliath story is the idea that it doesn't matter how big you are on the outside, it matters how big you are on the inside. And David was huge inside. He had a heart of courage, and he alone was not afraid uh, to fight Goliath. There's another aspect that follows through of the popularity of this being told from parents to children, and that is that David, as the young, unpromising hero who's crude and inexperienced, is akin to children, and this is a coming-of-age moment proving himself and his manhood. Giant stories are plentiful in the Bible, and many times giants are seen as heroes, as in the case of St. Christopher, who once helped the Christ child cross a river. St. Christopher put the child on his back and started to cross the river. But as he was going through the river, the river became deeper, the child became heavier, and the river became wider. Then, as all of these tribulations started to take part, he then decided, I can't allow a child to fall. I must carry on. So he carried on until at last he came to the other side, and the child became the vision of Christ. But giants were not just relegated to the land of morality tales in ancient religions. Over time, legends of giants grew to impact the culture of an entire nation. When the Celts arrived on these shores, they found the standing stones, the burial chambers, and they were so great that the Celtic imagination, the Celtic storytelling tradition, came to see that these must have been built by giants. You're watching Giants, friend or foe, on the History Channel. If there is one place on Earth that can lay claim to being the true land of giants, it is the British Isles. Celtic culture and history are filled with hundreds of references to the giant kind, both friend and foe. rolling field of yellow grass two hours southwest of London, multi-ton boulders make up an archaeological site of gargantuan importance. Stonehenge. The story that Stonehenge was built by giants belongs really to that uh, very colorful weaver of tales, Geoffrey of Monmouth, the Welsh monk who in 1136 published his History of the Kings of Britain. According to Geoffrey of Monmouth, Stonehenge was originally in Ireland, and Uthapain Dragon, the father of King Arthur, ordered Merlin to bring the stones from Ireland to Stonehenge to mark a burial place of several local chieftains and princes. Although some versions of the story say it was Merlin, others tell that it was a British king named Vortigaun, who after defeating a race of English giants, dispatched them to Ireland to retrieve a group of special stones. Off they went, and across the sea, they carried the great stones back. 
These were erected on Salisbury Plain by command of Vortigan himself, who said that Stonehenge would serve ever after as a marker to those brave followers of his who had died fighting the giant kind. And there it remains to this day. The last of this race of giants who are credited with building Stonehenge are Gog and Magog. The legend says they were defeated by the Romans and brought to England to protect the city of London. Today, statues of Gog and Magog still have a place of prominence in the old city's government building, the Guild Hall. The statues themselves have a storied past. They were destroyed during the Great Fire of London in 1666. They were rebuilt but destroyed again in 1940 during the German Blitzkrieg of the city. In 1953, they were built a third time and given a place of honor high above the floor in the building's Great Hall, though it is questionable whether most Britons know who they are. Many who visit the Guild Hall probably look up at the two statues and just wonder who on earth these two characters are, little realizing perhaps that these were amongst the original inhabitants of this island, so legend claims. The majority of English giant stories are found not in the bustle of London, but in the picturesque antiquated villages that dot the British countryside. The town of Cernobos is a good example. Founded in 987, it remained a thriving community until the mid-16th century when its abbey closed and the village fell into disrepair. In about the 17 and 1800s, it took on a new lease of life because the water uh, here was very pure. And suddenly, CERN found itself uh, as a center of a major brewing industry in the south. And in fact, its beer not only was uh, sort, of, sort of pushed around all over this country, but I'm told it was also exported to the West Indies and the Americas. Today, it is a picture postcard town, attracting tourists from around the world who want to see centuries-old pubs and restaurants and arguably England's largest giant. One of the many tales portrays the giant as an invading Danish monster who came across the sea and after a day of pillaging, fell asleep on a hillside. The locals living in the area proceeded to cut off his head. To warn other giants to stay away, they made an enormous chalk outline of their fallen prey. The giant is made from tons of small white stones that are cleaned and replaced every seven years. The giant measures 180 feet in height. He carries a massive club and is best seen from the air. However, the giant's most prominent feature, one that can still make the people of Cernobos blush, is the towering chalk outline of his phallus. I think the main statement is about 30 feet long, which, which I think one lady who was being interviewed said, that would bring the tears to your eyes, and I think that sums it up, actually. <laughs> Of course, nobody really knows when the giant was carved. There's many different stories. Uh, some say he's a fertility symbol. In fact, so much so that it is rumored in the locality that courting couples and married couples have been known to consummate their relationship on his... Uh... If a girl getting married wants to have children, what you should do is go up there with your husband and stay overnight up there. And in fact, I've heard it done, but what its success rate is, I'm not sure. <laughs> but occasionally when we have weddings here in the church, the bride and bridegroom will go up there in their wedding dress and, and, and go up there and sort of symbolically sort of sit on the giant and uh, hope that it brings them good luck in their married life with children. While the Cernobos giant catches attention for his sexual prowess, another English giant draws crowds simply because he gets up and walks. He's called the Bolster Giant, and he lives in the small English village named St. Agnes. The giant Bolster of St. Agnes was so tall that he could stand with one leg on top of St. Agnes Beacon, and his other foot could reach as far as Carnbray, which is about five miles away. Every 
every May, the people of the town bring out the effigy of the giant and parade him along the towering cliffs above the sea, a place where the locals say they see the face of the giant on the side of mountains. Legend has it that along these cliffs, the giant met and fell in love with the beautiful and devout St. Agnes. Now, the fact that the giant had a wife mattered not because giants uh, were considered to be incredibly lustful. That was one of their attributes. And so he became infatuated with the blessed St. Agnes and asked her to marry him or asked her to live with him in, in any case. Now, she being a virtuous Christian lady refused, but the giant was nothing if not persistent. And so he tormented her daily, sending her gifts of dead animals. I could think of better gifts, but uh, remember that this is a rather stupid giant. She knew that he was terrifying the whole of the village, that somehow or other the village had to get rid of him, so she agreed to marry him on one condition, that he filled her well with his blood. And the stupid giant believed her and slashed his wrist and allowed blood to fall into the hole. Gradually, the giant bled to death, which shows a triumph of virtuous Christianity over the stupid paganism, if you like. The story has been told in St. Agnes for at least 400 years. It's believed it was started during a time when the Catholic Church was doing everything it could to demonize other religions. One of the interesting things about the early church is that, of course, the church is trying to stamp out the Celtic faith, the Celtic religion. And the way it's doing it is to assimilate that Celtic religion into its own religion. So Celtic giants effectively then become demonized. So the church will create demons where the Celts saw a giant, the church sees the devil. Where the Celts made a rock formation, the work of giants. As far as the church concerned, it's the work of devils. So effectively the devil is becoming, if you like, the giant of the Christian religion. And yet, so strong is this folklore that it's still circulating. For the townspeople of St. Agnes today, their Goliath is a vivid reminder of nature's dark side, which must be conquered. He represents anarchy. Essentially, he comes from the ground and he is tamed. So he's the wilder spirit, the wilder element of us. So he's disorder, but we love him. The bolster giant is well known along the shores of Cornwall, but his notorious antics pale in comparison to another nearby giant named Cormoran. Cormoran, the ferocious giant, used to live on the mount, and each night he would come striding across the bay to pillage and plunder the local households. He would kill the cattle, kill the sheep, rob the crops. He was the terror of the neighborhood. Legend says Cormoran's reign of terror continued until one boy decided he'd had enough. You're watching Giants, Friend or Foe, on the History Channel. Along the rocky shores of Western England, in the seaside towns of Cornwall, the world's most famous giant stories were born. This is the land that spawned the sagas known as Jack the Giant Killer and Jack and the Beanstalk. As with most folklore, the tales were attempts by locals to make sense of their world by creating stories of danger, morality, and religious symbolism. Talking about Jack the Giant Killer, there are actually many traditions that come together. There is a reference to biblical legend with David using trickery to outwit the giant, and you see this in the Jack the Giant Killer. There's also this idea of the young lad, the name Jack from nursery rhymes, Jack and Jill. Many folklorists assert it comes from the idea of Jack being a youthful figure. The stories also tried to make sense of the area's raw natural beauty and physical hazards. The most spectacular feature of the region is a craggy speck of land, less than a mile out to sea, called St. Michael's Mount. 
Well, we're in the southwest of the country. We're in Cornwall, the magical land of giants on a boulder-strewn shoreline, standing next to the causeway that leads to the magical St. Michael's Mount. It truly puts it into perspective, for as you can see, it would take a giant of a man to be able to stride from the island onto the mainland. Even today, just getting to the mount can be treacherous. Ocean tides play tricks with visitors, quickly and quietly swallowing the stone path that connects the island with the mainland. When the tide's in, you'd have to be a giant to get over there. It's said that St. Michael's Mount was built by a giant named Cormoran, who entrusted his wife, Cormelia, to build it with the finest white quartz rock she could find. Cormelia got exhausted with this daily trek to find these perfect stones, and one day as she trekked out, found a piece of ordinary green stone and thought that would do. So come striding back towards the island, she did. And Cormoran, seeing her approach with an inferior product, was so angered, he stepped out of the bay and gave her a hefty kick, causing her to drop the rock here on the approach to the causeway. It said that 600 years ago, people were tormented by the ruthless Cormoran, who along with his brothers lived in the towering castle on the mount. Cormoran was the bane of the territory. He'd wade across to the mainland every night. He would kill cattle, sheep. He would take the produce from the farms and then go back to his rocky lair on St. Michael's Mount. One day, a teenage farm boy decided he and his family had been terrorized enough. If the town's leaders could not kill the giant, he would. The boy's name was Jack. There are several versions of how Jack attacked the giant. One story has him hiding in Cormoran's shoe and riding back to the castle to discover the treasure trove of riches the giant and his brothers had amassed. It was rumored that the giants were incredibly wealthy. Being long lived and incredibly old, they had amassed great fortunes through their wickedness and paganism. And this was lying in the vaults of their castle and Jack was determined to see what was in there. After the giants fell asleep, Jack crawled out of Cormoran's shoe and moved up the giant's shirt. The giant stirred and he said, who is climbing inside my shirt? To which Jack replied, Go back to sleep, it is only a fly crossing your chest. And the giant lay back and closed his eyes. Jack produced a large knife and cut the giant's throat. Jack went down into the basement, which was piled high with gold and silver. And Jack and his family never had to worry about inflation again. Another version of the story has Jack brave the frigid North Atlantic waters and swim to St. Michael's Mount. He then dug a pit large enough to trap the giant. At this point, Jack the giant killer blew his horn and roused the sleeping titan. And Comran looked to see who it was that had disturbed his slumber and saw Jack standing on the other side of the deep pit. So he utters to Jack the threat, you saucy villain, how dare you disturb my rest? I shall broil thee for my breakfast. And so saying, he races at Jack and tumbles headlong into the deep pit. Jack then picks up his pickaxe and embeds it deep into Comran's skull and kills him outright. When the villagers heard the youth had killed Cormoran, they dubbed their hero with a title, Jack the Giant Killer. The tales can be traced to the 15th century, a time when the world was rife with religious turmoil. Once again, stories of evil, immoral, pagan-like giants help church leaders cast a shadow of wickedness on those who oppose them. But young Jack's exploits did not end with his victory at St. Michael's Mount. Storytellers of the time put his character to good use. 
First of all, he becomes the trusted servant of King Arthur's son, kills several more giants in that guise, and is then uh, able to trick one giant out of a very useful weapon, the Cloak of Invisibility. In fact, King Arthur, by this stage, is so pleased with Jack's giant-killing exploits that he makes him a knight of the round table and gives him the task of ridding Wales of the many giants that are terrorizing the Kingdom of Wales. Jack was given the task of killing a particularly nasty, two-headed giant named Thundell. Thundell might not be able to see Jack thanks to Jack wearing the Cloak of Invisibility, but he can certainly smell him. And thus it is from his lips of first issued, perhaps what is the best known utterance of the entire saga. Fie, fee, fo, fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. Unfortunately, uh, Thundell is easily outwitted by Jack, who lures him onto a drawbridge that he's booby-trapped, and consequently Thundell crashes through the drawbridge, and Jack promptly decapitates him. Regardless of the version, one thing that is constant in the early variations of the Jack story is violence. Jack is always an outmatched youth who uses his wits to cut the throat of his enemy or chop off his head. This theme that is found in earlier tales where they were meant for adults as well as for children poses the giant as carnivorous or cannibalistic. They want to not only defeat us, but they want to devour us. And there are other variations of this as well in, in other stories. The Jack figure lodges with the giant and the giant says, Though you will lodge with me tonight, you will not live to see the morning light. I will bash your brains with my club outright. But during the 19th century Victorian era, the character of Jack the Giant Killer suddenly changed. The British printing industry began churning out children's books, and it was impossible for publishers to tell tales with so much violence. The traditional Jack the Giant Killer is effectively a psychopath, a vicious thug embedding his pickaxe into giants' heads, decapitating giants. By Victorian times, the giant stories have settled into the domain of children's literature. Jack was no longer a noble giant killer with King Arthur's court. Instead, he became a Victorian version of a teenage slacker, complete with the repressed sexual themes of the times. This tale is perhaps the most famous giant story in the world, Jack and the Beanstalk. The traditional Jack and the Beanstalk story, of course, has Jack as a, a lazy gopher, an idler, and his mother is always nagging him to go out and do better. And, of course, they are a very poverty-stricken household. It all begins with a cow that no longer can give milk. Jack's mother tells her son to take the cow into town and sell it at the market. There's a lot of speculation about the reason why the cow is being sold is because it no longer has milk. So it's this maternal symbol, and Jack needs to break away from the mother at the same time he wants the approval of the mother. Jack, of course, is very easily taken in by what might well be called a con man at the market. And the man says, well, I'll take the cow, but it was all I have is these beans, but they're magical beans. So Jack happily accepts the magical beans. When Jack's mother discovered what her son had done, she scolded him for being so foolish. She threw the beans and they took root in the rich soil next to a stream. The following morning, Jack woke to find a towering beanstalk where the beans had landed. Jack could not resist the temptation. The great psychologist Bruno Bettelheim in his book The Uses of Enchantment offers uh, a very detailed and elaborate, uh, what I would call a Freudian analysis of, of the story, emphasizing the idea that it's about a boy breaking away from his mother and moving into sexuality as an adult male. And of course the concept is the cow no longer gives the milk, you know, the mother doesn't give the milk, the boy has these erotic dreams, he wakes up and finds this phallic beanstalk climbing to the sky. Cautiously, Jack climbed the stalk's gnarly trunk into the clouds where he found the kingdom of a giant. Firstly, he escapes with money. 
Secondly, he escapes with a goose that lays a golden egg. And the last time, it is a golden harp which sings to the giant. But this time, the harp calls out, Master, master, someone is stealing me. And the giant wakes up and pursues Jack to the top of the beanstalk. Jack suddenly acquires the heroic uh, virtues of Jack the Giant Killer, uh, manages to shin down the beanstalk and chop down the beanstalk, causing the giant to fall to his death. And Jack and his mother live happily ever after on the proceeds which he has got in the giant's kingdom. Since the mother is often portrayed as a widow and Jack is an only child, this uh, giant is in fact a kind of father figure who he also needs to defeat to exact his revenge, sometimes actually in the story. It will be announced that the giant was the murderer of his real father. So there's a double conflict that's going on. So one of the moral justifications for stealing is to exact revenge. Well, the beanstalk is only the added part to the story where he goes because his family are in adversity and he goes and gets great wealth by defeating a giant. And what could be a better story for a child? Overcoming adversity and keep going, keep going, keep at it, and in the end you will be successful. I think there's also a simpler, even deeper meaning to the story, and that goes back to a basic human desire uh, to climb to the heavens and discover great beings. Created on the British Isle, Jack and the Beanstalk remains one of the most famous giant stories of all time. But on a nearby shore, a tall tale of another renowned giant remains an important part of Irish heritage, the legend of Finn McCool. They said he was as strong as a lion. When he was in bad temper, he stamped his feet and he had an earthquake around the whole of Ireland. But it's the question of how this unusual formation of rocks on the edge of the North Atlantic was created that has the Irish asking, could it have been built by their beloved giant, Finn McCool? You're, you're watching Giants, friend or foe, on the History Channel. Since the beginning of time, people have struggled to find ways to explain the creation of massive, larger-than-life natural phenomenon. Before the benefit of modern science, the answer most often agreed upon could be summed up in one word, giants. When early men began to view grit boulders, great stones, great circles, which had been left either by previous peoples or by glacial action. They began to wonder how these sort of things could have come about. The answer for them as a means of explanation was that they could only have been carried there by giants. Giants are so often associated with rocks and mountains. It's easy to look up at the mountains around us and, and imagine that these are giants who have been frozen in time for some reason, whether they're evil, whether it's magic, or whether they're just uh, the, the remains of the old ones who once walked the earth. But in the mystical land of Ireland, giants are not just relegated to the realm of simplistic folklore. One of the best-known Irish giant stories was written during a time of British domination over the Emerald Isle in the early 18th century by a young man studying to be a cleric. The author's name was Jonathan Swift. The story he wrote was Gulliver's Travels. Gulliver's Travels is actually a satire in which a giant appears. The giant is, of course, Lemuel Gulliver, who is an ordinary seaman who is shipwrecked on the shores of a country of pygmies. The country is Lilliput. Finding Gulliver on their shores, they are immediately taken with his size. There are all kinds of escapades that are involved where Gulliver ends up having to help the Lilliputans. One of the ones that 
I think people tend to remember is where there's a great palace fire and Gulliver ends up urinating on the palace in order to save it and therefore bond himself to the Lilliputans. And there's this uneasy relationship with him as benefactor, as well as the same time being uh, treated as a kind of king, which he doesn't want to be. The Lilliputians saw this giant not as a scientific curiosity, but as a weapon they could use to wage war against their enemy. Swift was playing on the old confrontational notion of the giants, which is innate in every one of us, where the big man will dominate, whether he is big physically or whether he is big politically. And so what you're getting is a sort of allegory of politics and the, the giant becomes the symbol of a corrupt political system being used towards an end, which is what Swift was actually talking about. What many people don't realize is that there's a postscript to that, that the voyage that follows is in fact to America, where Gulliver is smaller than the people he encounters. So suddenly he is the dwarf compared to the giants. And in many ways, this may be a prophecy of things to come because he sees the great power of this breed of giants on the American soil and imagines, in fact, that they're likely to defeat English manners and their arrogance. Along the coast of Northern Ireland, near the town of Bushmills, folk musicians fill the pubs with the soundtrack of storytelling tradition. It was down by the Songs are rich with images of lonely lives and lost loves, Celtic magic and mystery, Irish intrigue and illusion. It is a sound that echoes across the rolling green fields and muddy moors to a place steeped in Irish lore. Because less than a mile from where the band plays and pints of Guinness pour like water is one of the most captivating and baffling rock formations in the world. For thousands of years, the Irish have tried to explain the origin of this place. Millions of hexagonal stones that cascade from a mountaintop and disappear into the Irish Sea. People come from all over the world to see the stones, making it the most popular attraction in all of Ireland. The Irish have given it a name, the Giant's Causeway. When, for example, men came to look at something like the Giant's Causeway, they said, who could have constructed this? This cannot have been constructed by nature. Look at how the hexagonal shapes are laid out. This could only have been constructed by thinking individuals. And so the answer was giants. The scientific explanation is the stones at the Giant's Causeway were made by a volcanic eruption millions of years ago. When the hot lava was quickly cooled in the frigid seawater, the unique shape of the stones was formed. The causeway was the perfect place for the imaginations of early Irish storytellers to take flight. Centuries ago, they gave birth to the legend of a magical, massive giant named Finn McCool. Finn McCool was a wonderful giant. He was 16 meters tall. He was loved by everybody in this area. Um, people years ago didn't understand how the causeway was made, so they came up with the idea that Finn McCool the giant made it. So he lived here with his wife Una and his son Ashing. Una McCool, Finn's wife, was not a giant. In fact, she was a beautiful local girl. A typical scenario in many folk tales where the giant is kind. It is noteworthy that many giants have mortal women as wives. One of the questions is, what happens when giants are not loners? Very often they seek mates as a part of their urge, and when they do, they often are looking to mortal women, often very beautiful mortal women. The Giant's Causeway is on a piece of Irish land that is only 20 miles across the sea from Scotland. 
It's the proximity between the two nations and a rivalry that goes back centuries that many believe sparked the story of how the Giants Causeway was built and destroyed. One day, Finn was going for a walk and he heard about the Scottish giant, Ben and Donna. And the Scottish giant was showing off, saying he was bigger and better than Finn McCool. And he said he was going to come over here and steal away all of Finn's possessions and, and take away all of his land. So as you can imagine, Finn was absolutely annoyed about this completely bad temper. The legend said that Ben and Donner had begun to build a causeway in order that he could come across and fight Finn McCool and put an end to their rivalry forever. Finn, hearing of this, began to do exactly the same from here in North Antrim. The two met in the middle and there was a massive fight between the two of them in which the causeway was scattered. So what we have today is this, the beginning of the causeway here, the Atlantic Ocean in the middle, and then on the other side in Scotland and the island of Staffa, we have the other side of the causeway. Another popular version of the story shows the wit and cunning of Finn McCool and adds a little Irish humor to the dark giant's tale. In this story, Finn builds the long causeway to Scotland to challenge Ben and Donner. But so exhaustive was that work that uh, he came back and promptly fell asleep and was sleeping a fine sleep when the other giant from Scotland decided to come over the causeway and Finn's wife woke up and heard the giant approaching and the giant came steaming ashore crying out, where's that coward McCool? I'll battle him now. So Una came up with a wonderful plan. She was a very clever lady. And what she did was she ordered Finn to get into the cart. She put a little bonnet over his head and he pretended to be the baby. Ben and Donner comes across to North Antrim and finds Finn's wife with the baby in the cradle. Where's Finn McCool? Where's Finn McCool? And Una says, he's left me with the baby. And he says, that's a very fine baby. And she says, yes, it is. And he says, she says, he's like his father. Now, this terrifies Ben and Donner, who says, if the, if the child is like that, what is the father going to be like? And flees, uh, throw, scattering the giant's causeway behind him. Some even believe one of the massive boulders left behind by volcanic activity millions of years ago is Finn McCool's shoe. There's a story at the causeway that when Finn was running away from the Scottish giant Ben and Donner because he saw that he was far too big for him to fight, he ran so fast that he, he lost one of his boots. And this boot can now be found here at the causeway, and this is it, um, the 16-metre giant's boot. They, we have actually had a forensic anthropologist who has studied the boots and measured the boots and the width, the length, the height of the boot and has worked out the size that Finn McCool's feet would have been size 95. The tale of Finn McCool was able to thrive because of the rich tradition of Irish storytelling. But the Emerald Isle is not the only place where legends of giants have taken root. The tradition of the American tall tale giant is a completely different tradition. Paul Bunyan is probably the best one to take a look at. Paul Bunyan was a leader of men, certainly larger than life. With one swing of the axe, he could cut 40 acres. The stories of this rugged individualist gave countless men in a dangerous profession an immortal frontiersman to look up to. You're watching Giants, friend or foe, on the History Channel. The legends of giants have haunted mankind since storytellers first told tales. You can find giant stories in almost every culture. And there's kind of a base myth that, that links these stories together. And that's the idea that there was an older race in a time before time, the world was populated by a race of giants. And that when the human race came, they had to do battle with the giants to find their own place in the world. The rock formations of the American desert southwest are some of the most massive and remarkable works of nature on the planet. Modern science can explain away these towering boulder tapestries by citing volcanic activity that occurred here a million years ago. 
But to the native people who once walked these lands, these rocks are what is left of a race of giants. The Pawnees believe that before there were men, there were these race of giants. And there was a, a great creator, but the giants did not believe in that creator. And as a result, the creator distributed their remains in the landscape as stone mountains and hills. Obviously, mountains are a big aspect in giant stories, and so many giant stories take place in the mountains. And all we have to do is, is, is look around us at, at, at the mountains here and, and see that it would be easy for early man to imagine giants inhabiting these mountains. But as the American continent became settled and European science could explain the existence of rock formations and other natural phenomena, the legends of giants began to change. American giants were slightly different to the European giants. The European giants had been very monstrous. But for the settlers in a new world, the landscape itself was monstrous. So you didn't need terrifying giants. What you might need was giants who were benign, who could help you. Big man. Nowhere was this more evident than in the turn of the 20th century logging camps of North America, where towering white pine trees were just waiting to be cut in places like Maine, Michigan, and Minnesota. Life in these camps was brutally harsh. Men logged timber during the winter because it was easier for horses to pull sleighs filled with logs on ice rather than on dirt ground. The camps were self-sustaining mini-cities. Everything a logger needed had to be stored or made because the nearest town was usually 30 miles away. Working in white pine logging camps was a pretty dangerous profession. You were constantly fighting the elements. You were moving heavy trees. So death, fear of death was probably on the minds of these jacks. These people are traveling out in cold climates, cutting down trees, very sharp axes. Once you're hit by an ax, the likelihood that you can get back to a hospital is, is slim to none. It's a rough, rough kind of life. As many as 300 camps operated during a winter in Minnesota alone, the difficult work and the extreme conditions were the perfect proving ground, not only for physical strength, but mental escape through storytelling. The character that was most talked about was a mythic figure who was as big as the nation itself. In the new developing American continent, there were plenty of big men. Now, these were not physically big men, but they were heroes, men who were carving out areas of the new country. And gradually, they began to assume giant status, just as in ancient uh, Europe. Some of the great kings and heroes had assumed giant and superhuman status. By the early 1900s, the name of only one giant dominated the tales told round the fire in lumberjack bunkhouses. Paul Bunyan. It's believed this Goliath was an amalgam of several backwoods giants whose stories were told in the 1800s. Paul Bunyan, in the earliest stories, was not a giant. The earliest stories emphasize his cleverality, his intelligence. Uh, it's only later that they start expanding and he starts growing as the stories develop. He starts as a very strong man and becomes an impossibly large man, uh, someone who's responsible really for the creation of all the natural features of the West. Many of the Paul Bunyan legends fit into the idea of tall tales. There are many of these kinds of giant exploits where the scale is greatly exaggerated. A tall tale characterization of the American spirit, an individuality and an independence. They find in Paul Bunyan a character who represents them, represents uh, the, the loneliness, the separation, the, uh, the feats of strength, uh, and he's impossibly large and impossibly great. He's someone that, uh, if, if there's ever a competition, you can finish the competition by saying, well, you may have finished off 16 flapjacks, you may have cut down uh, a dozen trees uh, today, but you'd never be able to beat Paul Bunyan. 
Paul Bunyan represented to the lumberjack, the men who worked in the woods, as somebody who could not be stopped. There was no obstacle, no problem too big. He was a giant, but he was a thinking giant. He was a mental Hercules. Everything about Paul Bunyan was larger than life. He dragged his ax and created the St. Lawrence Seaway. He could clear a forest in a day. He's one of us, but he's better, stronger, and more powerful than any of us. People are always involved in these contests of strength, but nothing compares to Paul Bunyan. If Paul Bunyan could do those things, then you could go out the next day and face the cold. You could face any obstacle that Mother Nature or the foreman or anybody else could throw at you because you were a lumberjack and you were strong. The stories were meant to bolster the spirits of workers in the logging camps, accenting the camaraderie that was so important to these men. The tales became an instant success. Though Paul Bunyan was known as a rugged individualist who could level a mountain, he was also known for having a kind heart. At his side was his trusted friend, Babe, the Blue Ox. Even the story of how Paul found Babe is the stuff of heartfelt kindness. In the winter of the blue snow, Paul saw this little small thing almost frozen to death in the snow, and he picked him up and he held him in his hands. It was a little calf, and this little calf responded to Paul's kindness, and it grew and grew and grew. And it, well, they called him Babe because he was small. When Paul and Babe played, their footprints created the Great Lakes. When Paul wanted a place for Babe to lie down and rest, he cleared all the forests he could see. That's why there's so few trees in North Dakota. Babe became Paul's best friend, his ally, his major worker to help him move the, the timber and became as almost as large in life as Paul Bunyan. Paul Bunyan is probably the most prominent example of these giants that have been associated with American legend. In many cases, they've also entered or were created by popular culture, building on this need of some common American identity. And though a handful of stories about Paul were told during the first few years of the 20th century, he didn't become truly famous until 1914. That year, an advertising copywriter named W.B. Laughhead wrote a pamphlet for the Red River Logging Company featuring Paul Bunyan. For the first time, Paul and Babe came to life in the printed word, and Laughhead's stories and drawings made them household names. Laughhead is the one who basically created most of what we think of uh, in terms of Paul Bunyan. He's the one who turned Paul into a giant. He created Babe the Big Blue Ox. And so this is really kind of like the Ronald McDonald of his time. Paul Bunyan was a corporate logo. It started out slow, but the legend of Paul Bunyan caught on. And within a few years, uh, people all over the country were reading about uh, this legendary figure. And Paul is, is seen, shows up at uh, helping out in the oil fields and shows out on the West Coast, uh, cutting the big redwood trees. And later on, you have Paul Bunyan stamping out 40 acres of forest fire in one shot. There is a real difference in the way modern people tell these stories. In a way, we're, we're mimicking the stories of the past because there's resonance for us. We enjoy those stories. We enjoy the idea of thinking that Paul Bunyan created the Great Lakes. It's fun to think of it, but we don't need it anymore in the same way that primitive people needed these uh, stories to explain natural phenomena. At the Forest History Center in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, the memory of Paul Bunyan has never faded. Here, volunteers struggle to recreate the harsh conditions of the North Woods logging camps. Oh, well, that hand belonged to Paul Bunyan. Paul Bunyan became the darling of songwriters who penned wild tales of the giant and how his mighty acts changed the face of the nation. The soundtrack that keeps the work moving is gleaned from the pages of the past, when lyrics of Paul Bunyan's deeds helped inspire loggers during the long, frigid winters. Inside all the lumberjacks, I think there's a little bit of Paul Bunyan. And Paul Bunyan didn't die. Paul Bunyan lives on. Unlike a lot of our folk heroes, our giants, when you hear the distant thunder, 
That's not Thunder. That's Paul Bunyan and Babe. They're playing. They're romping up there. They still exist in our minds and our hearts. Across the Northwest, stories of Paul Bunyan continue to fascinate and entertain. While another legend emerged in the East, John Henry can hold two 10-pound hammers, one in one hand, one in the other, and uh, single-handedly uh, drill through a mountain. So there's no dynamite necessary. He carried the hopes and dreams of the American working class, overcoming impossible odds. You're, you're watching Giants, friend or foe, on the History Channel. With the swing of a sledgehammer, he carved himself an indelible place in American history. He brought down mountains and built railroads. He died for what he believed in and became a giant among men. His name was John Henry, working class hero. In the songbook of American folk music, few characters have had more than a dozen ballads written about them. But John Henry, a mythic man turned giant, has more than 100 songs detailing his exploits. John Henry was a steel driving man. He died with a hammer in his hand. That's the way that the story works. The legend is that John Henry uh, is a hammer man, uh, drives a sledgehammer, uh, hits a drill, tunneling through a mountain. of engineers come along with a steam drill. The steam drill, they say, is going to outperform John Henry, and uh, John Henry challenges the engineers with the steam drill to a race. It speaks especially to the conflict of industry and the displacement of humans. The legend of John Henry was born in the mountains of West Virginia in the decade following the American Civil War. Railroad lines were being carved from the landscape, and there were not enough laborers to do the difficult jobs. In many instances, inmates from prisons near the new rail lines were commandeered to do the toughest and most dangerous work. One of the worst jobs on the railroad was building tunnels, pounding holes in a mountain and then blasting it with explosives. It's terrible work. Its idea was that you'd drive a, a kind of hole about four and a half inches wide, a pilot hole into the side of the mountain, put dynamite in it, and explode it. And so these people are moving through a tunnel with uh, lots of sand and microscopic bits that they're inhaling then. Lots of the folks that are building the Lewis Tunnel, for example, all the convicts, there are 400 of them. 40 of them die uh, in 1871, 40 of them die again in 1872. It's, it's deadly work. In the post-war South, many slaves were freed, only to find themselves forced into a different type of bondage, put in prison on trumped-up charges. Legend has it that one of these convicts was named John Henry, whose brawny strength made him a natural for the tunneling jobs on the railroad. There was a real John Henry in the 1870 census. He shows up in the Richmond Penitentiary. Uh, first name John, last name Henry, born in New Jersey, and ended up like so many black men in Virginia in this criminal system. And he shipped to the Lewis Tunnel for construction. Despite all the free labor, railroad owners saw the way of the future, not in the strength of men, but in the power of machines. A new machine was brought in that many believed could bore a hole faster than the men working on the railroad. The prideful John Henry challenged the engineers from the railroad company to a race, him against the steam drill. Lifting his nine-pound hammer, John Henry said, show me the machine, I can beat it. Competition was arranged between the two. was actually able to work faster than the steam engine, but he was so determined to defeat the machine, he collapsed from exhaustion and fell to his death. John Henry's heart cracked, and he collapsed. After completing a feat of supernatural ability, superhuman ability, 
John Henry became a legend because he had died beating the machine and showing the triumph of the human spirit uh, over the mechanized world. Remember, this is right after the Civil War. A lot of the discussion about black men tends to be that they're lazy and that they don't work hard enough and these sorts of things. And here's a story about a man who works terribly hard, so hard, in fact, that it kills him. So that's part of the reason, I think, why the story catches on, why people pass that story about a strong, powerful man like John Henry. The tale of John Henry lay dormant for several decades until the early 1920s, during the Harlem Renaissance, when black writers were looking for heroes to turn into giants. Sterling Brown writes poetry about uh, John Henry. Zora Neale Hurston travels through Florida picking up stories about Moses and about John Henry and how great and powerful John Henry is. Fred Becker is a, an artist who draws these wild, uh, they become steel engravings of John Henry with one arm is an octopus and another arm is a, is a freight train. He's a powerful, powerful man who goes through hell and uh, climbs back out again. And so in the Harlem Renaissance, he goes from being a little bit uh, sad, into a powerful and strong and, and virile man. It shows a giant of a man, a superhuman man, which American giants became. In the 1930s, he grew larger. He has become politicized because of the idea of a worker who is oppressed by the industrial corporate system. He becomes a perfect symbol for the Communist Party. Here's a powerful man with a sledgehammer who's fighting against the capitalist machine right beside him. John Henry becomes uh, one of the ways in which the Communist Party is pointing to its working class roots. There's a giant who they call John Henry Stood taller than a railroad tree Though he come from smaller beginnings He's still taller than a U.N. Songwriters of the time took advantage of the historically rich stories about John Henry and of the men who died building the nation's railroads. One famous ballad ends with a line that for years had stumped historians. A lot of versions of the song end. They took John Henry to the White House and they buried him in the sand. And every locomotive that comes roaring by says there lies a steel driving man. It's an odd way of ending a song. It's, it's kind of peculiar that John Henry was so important that he was taken to the White House. And there's no railroad at the White House and there's no sand really at the White House. It, it just doesn't make that much sense. But in doing research for a book on John Henry, author Scott Nelson came across some photos of the old Virginia penitentiary, from which many railroad workers were recruited. I'm looking at the picture of the Virginia penitentiary, and I'm humming the song, wandering around the house, and um, I sing the last bar of the song, and I look at the Virginia penitentiary, there's a huge white house, there's a railroad running by it, and there's sand all around it. The penitentiary was torn down in 1990, during excavation, a mass grave for prisoners was discovered between a large white house and the railroad tracks. The place where they found the bodies was right next to the old white house in the Richmond Penitentiary, near where the railroad ran by, buried in boxes, piano-sized boxes, five or six men at a time, with layers of sand beneath each one of the boxes. They took John Henry to the white house they buried him in the sand, and every locomotive that comes roaring by says there lies a steel driving man. It, it was a chilling and strange uh, story. Bury me in that white house sand. Bury me in that white house. No one will ever know what happened to the real life John Henry, but one thing is certain his legend will never die. If you've ever walked through a railroad tunnel, there's often water in the tunnel, and you can hear the water, and it sounds like, it sounds like a monster. Imagine people talking about that sound and saying, that's John Henry. John Henry's not dead. You can still hear him hammering. That sound that sounds like a monster, that's John Henry. The legend of John Henry continues to echo throughout the land, not only in the train tunnels he bore into mountains, but in the hearts and minds of those who believe the strength of the human spirit is still the strongest power on earth. You're, you're watching Giants, friend or foe, on the History Channel. In a 
small country cafe nestled in the hills of northern France, a storyteller weaves wild tales of the region's mysterious past. The Ruses were the largest giants in the whole world. But they were very unhappy where they were. So they decided to take a trip around the earth. For the trip around the earth, they would take clumps of earth. And why clumps of earth? For a trip around the earth, this story is a little too down to earth, so let's do it again. One of the best love stories he tells is how his town named Cassel came to be. There are two large hills that make up this village, and locals have an explanation of how the hills got there. It is said that the land formation is what's left of two giants who fell dead here hundreds of years ago. Northern France and most of neighboring Belgium are the stomping grounds of age-old giants. To the people living in this region, giants are more than just fictional characters to be celebrated. It's tradition to hoist a glass of some of the finest beer in the world, which happens to be named after giants. In fact, throughout the region, the image of giants are woven into the fabric of nearly every aspect of life. In the town of Ath, Belgium, called the City of Giants, people continue to celebrate the region's storied relationship with the giant kind. The giant phenomenon in Ath is very old. It started with procession in the Middle Ages, and then it's still alive today, which isn't the case in other towns. The custom of honoring giants by parading them in processions began in the Middle Ages. The Catholic Church started the tradition in the 15th century as a way to teach people religious stories. It was first a um, religious ceremony. So church wanted the people, the population, to learn something about the Bible. And it was a good medium. They had a procession with various topics about the Bible. Some say the festivals began as a way to worship multiple gods. Many of them are fertility gods. And processing them and showing them to the people ensures a good harvest. The history of the town's giants is as colorful as the stories they depict. More than once, the giants have been threatened with destruction during horrific wars. During the French Revolution, when the governments of both France and Belgium were under attack by revolutionaries, many of the giants were set fire and destroyed. The giants had to be built again because it was really the heart and the history of the city, so the French could burn it, but it wasn't. It was just a few years. Then they built it again because the giants belonged to the city. Following the fires of the revolution, the people of Ath changed their view of giants. The behemoths became guardians of the town, not religious symbols. Processions continued unabated until World War II, when once again the giants were in danger of being destroyed, this time by the Nazi occupation of France and Belgium. The Nazis did their best to outlaw the region's love of giants in an effort to curtail local traditions. But the people's love for their giants somehow managed to survive. Even under occupation, school children in Belgium would put together many processions of their giants. In the years following the war, the love for giants in Western Europe grew even larger. Today, giant processions are major events that attract thousands of people. For those in Ath who are part of bringing the giants to life, being involved in animating these creatures is a big honor. The people working for the giants who dress them, they are very proud to prepare them or to carry them. It's really an important part of their own family. Many hours of preparation go into every aspect of these handmade giants. The face is carefully formed from clay. 
personne derrière. A wicker basket is fashioned for the base with straps inside so a man can carry the giant. Clothes for the giants are chosen based on their personality and character, which range from soldiers and politicians to dancers and blue collar workers. Usually, one man carries a giant through the town, though getting him into one of those rigs can be a bit tricky. A team of carriers takes turns moving a giant on the streets, while the sounds of marching bands thunder off the walls of centuries old buildings. One of Ath's most popular giants is Goliath from the Bible story. There's a duel between David and Goliath that is depicted when a young boy from the town attempts to throw a beanbag through a small opening in the giant. In the Bible story, Goliath is very bad. He was defeated by David. So on the Saturday here, you also have a duel between Goliath and David, and everybody hopes that David will win. If David wins, then Goliath starts to dance, and everybody is quite happy about it. But the following day, the giant story is transformed. Instead of Goliath being a pagan champion of the Philistines, he's a symbol of the town's adoration of their giants. The next day, there is the wedding, and that's really a feast. Goliath has a, a wife, and everybody is very happy is getting married, and there's a whole ceremony. So it's not the Goliath of the Bible then. It's somebody else. It it's symbolizes the, the city of At. Year after year, people from all over Western Europe pack the city to see the processions, carrying on a tradition they say will most likely live for another 500 years. Around the world and well into modern times, icons and images of famous giants not only taught important lessons, but had the power to sell canned peas. Ho, ho, ho. Green Giants. You're watching Giants, friend or foe, on the History Channel. Giants. Giants. In the modern age, they conjure up images ranging from monsters at the movies to advertising icons that sell canned peas. But the real-life counterparts of fictional giants are perceived in much different ways than what is seen on film and television screens. Since the age of photography began, images of real-life giants have been well chronicled. Considered by most people to be nothing more than circus freaks, life for those who resembled giants in fairy tales was never easy. In the early days, life must have been pretty awful. They were regarded as freaks. They were regarded as people to be feared. They were regarded as great curios. So I would assume that life, even for a modern giant, would be painful and pretty awful. One person who suffered in this existence was Robert Wadlow. He was born in 1918 in Alton, Illinois. I'm Robert Wadlow, 12 years old, and weigh 240 pounds, and I'm, weigh, I'm about seven feet tall. As an adult, he stood eight feet, 11 inches, which makes him the tallest person in the history of the world. An overactive pituitary gland was the cause of Wadlow's huge size. Because he was so tall, his life was difficult, but he was always friendly and willing to talk about his height. The locals in Alton nicknamed him the Gentle Giant. By all accounts, he was a genial sort of fellow. But I also gather that he was given to periods of great depression and he was actually living in great pain because of the bone ailments from which he suffered. And I suspect Wadlow himself would have suffered from a slight curvature of the spine, which made it very difficult for them to sit in a chair like this and be comfortable. Wadlow died in 1940 at the age of 22. 
because his pituitary gland was heating his body like a blast furnace, he was unable to fight off an infection. The challenges faced by Robert Wadlow still afflict people of extraordinary size today. Though he is the child of normal-sized parents, George Murashan is seven feet seven inches tall. Like Wadlow, Murashan's height is the result of an overactive pituitary gland. Sometimes, uh, I grow over the summer, I grow, grow like six, seven inch. And when I go back to the school, my, my, my friends say, man, over the summer you grow so much. <laughs> Giants of today are stars in places like the National Basketball Association and can make millions in product endorsements. Mirashan is no exception. He was one of the tallest players to ever wear a professional uniform, playing professional basketball in both Europe and the United States. When I start to play basketball, I start to feel uh, normal because everybody was tall and I don't feel I was tall. I feel I was just a normal player. His size also brought him fame on the silver screen when he played opposite Billy Crystal in the movie My Giant. Billy Crystal was, saw me when I got to draft in 1993. And when he see me in the draft, he said, this is the guy who can play my, uh, my script. For me, it was something exciting. It was very exciting. The realities of being nearly eight feet tall can at times make negotiating through a normal-sized world a challenge. And though he dwarfs his average-sized son when the pair goes grocery shopping, Mirashan says the people in his town accept him and appreciate him for who he is and for being a giant. There are some short people and there are some tall people. No, everybody's normal. Everybody has something different. Though giants like Murashan have found ways to live normal lives, the images of fictional giants continue to be used for shock value by storytellers in the modern age of film and mass media. Certainly in modern day films, giants have gone back to their medieval personification. They're menacing, they're a nuisance. Uh, again, they're the very sort of thing that mankind has to overcome and indeed, Again, we're going back to this personification of a challenge that mankind, using his ingenuity, his bravery, his courage, can eventually defeat. Modern films continue to mine tales past and present of the giant kind, because just like storytellers of old, giants come with built-in fears common to us all. We can look to popular culture and see in films instances where there are still mysteries that have to be worked out, and giants become symbols for that. They have become subjects of B-movies. Attack of the 50-foot woman. They're coming to destroy our ordered world and coming to destroy our civilization. During the 1950s, with so many of the films that create giants out of ordinary circumstances. They occur as a result of nuclear disasters at a time of fear of what the effect of our own science has been. This was a very common theme. Uh, today, in addition to nuclear disaster or radiation, we also see uh, such themes being used around artificial intelligence or sometimes even UFOs or alien beings that come in as giants that need to be defeated from ordinary wits or of finding a particular weakness in those giants. Giants are most often employed as the ultimate boogeyman, inherently mindless, evil creatures whose only purpose is to destroy the Earth and humans. But making giants appear real is not easy. This was especially true during the 1950s and 1960s, when giants first became pop culture icons on the silver screen. The man credited with taking the image of giants out of the pages of storybooks and giving them a realistic portrayal in films is Ray Harryhausen. Harryhausen's skills as a filmmaker helped combine live-action actors 
with specially photographed giants. Though this was the age of space aliens in the Cold War, many of Harryhausen's giant stories were set in the world of ancient Greek mythology. I've always been attracted to the outrageous, the, the, the giant size. And that's why Greek mythology appealed to me, because the Greeks always thought the gods as just enlarged people like themselves. And they always pictured them as simply giant people living up in uh, Mount Olympus. Many of his films, which used state-of-the-art technology, such as optical printers, are considered classics. In the film Jason and the Argonauts, Harryhausen created an intimidating-looking creature called Talos, a metal statue on a rampage. This is a model of Talos. It was made, it's made of fiberglass, but it was uh, made from the same mold that the original model. I had to make him jerky, and I got criticized for that as having some jerky animation in the picture. But he was made of metal, and I felt that he should look, you know, not too smooth in his walking because he's not used to walking a bronze statue. But pop culture images of giants have been used for more more benevolent purposes. For example, one of the most famous uses of a giant has nothing to do with wicked images and mass destruction. He's known as the Jolly Green Giant, one of the world's most recognizable advertising images. Giants are used in popular culture, for example, in advertising campaigns, perhaps the most famous example being the Jolly Green Giant. Who can resist? Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. Green Giant. He was born in 1928 when the Minnesota Valley Canning Company put his image on the side of a can of extra-large green peas. The company eventually changed its name and became known as Green Giant Foods. The image of the Green Giant was known throughout the world. They live in a valley in which corn grows all the time, and they harvest it, and display the fruits of their labors to yourself and allow you to buy it. Giants often appear in advertising because they seem to show the huge scale and sometimes appeal of the product as a result. Giants also indicate that the product can be magical because of our association with this oral tradition. But even the green giant was not always considered so jolly. When designers first tested his image in the late 1920s, they found that the giant was too ominous looking. To make him more likable, his face was softened, and he eventually became the smiling, happy giant that he is today. It's a colossal figure, but it's a memorable figure, and I think that's the point of them to the popular culture. Ho, ho, ho. You see a giant, you remember a giant. Despite a few smiling faces, most of today's images of giants are from the dark side. Villains that lurk inside our souls, exploiting deep-seated fears we've carried since childhood. Giants are, are figures of dreams, and children dream about giants. I know that I myself, when I was about five years old, I had a recurring nightmare of a 2,000-foot lion. I think um, giants represent our fears sometimes in our dreams, and uh, it's natural that, that out of those dreams come stories of giants. Giants are the personification of all the problems that mankind must overcome in this hostile world. And often it's a very ordinary person to take the story of David and Goliath. If you notice with that story, David is very small, Goliath a titan. And yet David, with his ingenuity, is able to overcome the titan Goliath. Jack the giant killer. Jack is an ordinary boy, and yet his ingenuity, his quick wickedness, means that he can defeat the giant. The moral is, there is nothing, no problem, that we cannot overcome with our courage and our ingenuity. Despite some who scoff that tales of giants no longer have a place in a modern world, those who study the story say there will always be a home for the giant kind. One thing we can't escape is death, and giants question our own mortality. And so I think you're going to see stories about giants persist a long time, as long as people are born, grow up, and die. 
It's interesting, of course, how many characters from history become perceived as giants. And perhaps we can explain that with a, a modern example. One of the things that people often say when they meet Hollywood actors or rock stars is, oh, he's a lot shorter than I thought he'd be. And if you think back to the distant past, of course, our ancestors are hearing these stories of King Arthur, of Robin Hood, and the great things that they can overcome. So, of course, in their consciousness, these people are being perceived as giants. And perhaps if they were to meet Robin Hood, King Arthur, or even Jack the Giant Killer, they might, in whatever the dialect of their day was, say, ooh, that King Arthur, he's a lot shorter than I thought he'd be. They still maintain the power to terrify us, but also they uh, still retain the power to make us curious and uh, buy whatever products they come to offer. They are tales that have captivated us for centuries, superhuman forces beyond explanation. We all have giants we have to conquer, and I think that will always be true of the human race. They are the shadows in the night to be feared, and the last hope in dire circumstances. They have prowled the earth since time began, and will continue to stalk us until the sun sets for the final time on the land of humans and giants. Europe's dark ages were over, and a new creative age took over Italy. The Italian Renaissance is as overwhelmingly mind-blowing as it is beautiful. It is the time when that nameless builder will become the architect. Da Vinci's World on Engineering and Empire, tonight at 9 on the History Channel.